So we're going to end up looking for an equation to value an option. Now this option might be a, a call option, a put option, a binary call, a binary put. For now, just so we have something to think about, let's think about it being a call option. Now the V then will be the value, the value of the call option, and it's dependent on uh, two independent variables. The stock price, as the stock price goes up, the value of the call option goes up, and the, uh, the time. T is the time right now. We've got four parameters that'll make, uh, that, that will also come into play. Sigma is the volatility of the stock, of the underlying stock. Uh, capital, T, capital T is the time at which the option expires. R is the risk-free rate of return, and E is the exercise price. So capital T and um, E, the exercise price, those are just given in the contract. R, the risk-free rate of return, we'll use the rate on a 30 day US T bill and Sigma we know how to get that this the annualized standard deviation of the returns of the stock data those are the parameters so the things that actually change as uh, time goes on then are the stock price and time we're also going to assume that our stock is moving under a log based random walk log normal random walk let's say so our change in the stock is equal to mu s, mu is the drift, we got that as the uh, annualized mean um, return on the stock. There's our deterministic piece that changes with every dt, and our randomized piece where uh, sigma is the volatility of the stock, s is the stock price. We had that dx, we had, uh, when we made this up, couple of weeks ago we put in n as just to emphasize the fact that they were uh, pulled from a normal distribution so I'm putting that down here our DX our DX is our random variables that come from a normal distribution with mean zero and uh, standard deviation or of root DT that's going to mean then that our DX's are sort of like root DT's when we start to shrink time okay we'll shrink time down here but they're gonna act like and why if I needed to uh, put a one word reason why quadratic variation which is of course two words but that's the that's the reason why if you want to know more about that you can uh, dive deep into chapter um, five on stochastic calculus for our purposes we're just going to know that we treat that dx is distributed like a root uh, dt. That means then, so that means if I have ds squared, I end up getting, well, okay, I'm just, I've just squared this expression. I'm going to need that later. Just squared every piece here. So, ds squared. Here's where our simplification happens. One of the big assumptions that we make in the derivation of this Black-Scholes equation, because that's where I'm going with this, I'm going to end up making a partial differential equation, Black-Scholes equation, which is sort of a modified heat equation. And the solution to that partial differential equation will be the option price formula that we're looking for. We've already priced options using that multi-step binomial tree. And we talked about if um, if I put more steps in if the tree gets finer then I get a better answer because I get more possible futures with one step there's only two possible futures with two steps there's three possible futures with a hundred steps there would be um, 101 possible futures so as the num oh but with the number of steps then the, the DT goes down to zero as I cram more steps in. If, if the option expires in a month and I take daily steps, then our DT is um, one day or one 252th of a year. If I cram in um, double that, then our DT goes to one over uh, 504 and etc. So in other words, we're going to end up by, by thinking of taking that tree and splicing it finer and finer and finer to get a more of a continuum of possible futures on the end, then, I guess the way you guys are looking at it, a continuum of possible futures on the end as the tree splits up, 
then I have to cut it finer and finer. The time step has to go to zero. So we, we will be, in order to get a continuous equation, shrinking the time step to zero. As we do that, we'll have dt's to powers. We're going to make the assumption then, since dt is going to zero, that dt raised to any power greater than one, like dt squared, dt, squared, DT to the 1.5, will end up becoming too small to consider, so we're just going to drop it, we're going to cancel it out, we're going to make it zero for any dt to a power bigger than 1. Oh, so let's go back up to here where I squared ds. There's a ds squared. So that, I'm going to get rid of that because it's going to be too small to consider that dt squared as dt goes to 0. Also here, I have a dt, I'll just move it over, and a dx, but we're thinking of dx as root dt. So this will be dt to the power of 1, times dt to the power of 0.5. This piece will be like dt to the 1.5. It'll be too small to consider as we shrink dt. To, so I can drop it. So ds squared, once I use that simplification, just becomes sigma squared s squared. And dx is like a root dt. And when I square it then, this whole piece in the limit becomes a dt because of quadratic variation. So if I have a ds squared and I'm shrinking dt equal to zero, I can replace it by that expression. All right, now let's get down to this box here. What do we got? Well, what I've done is I've taken, I know that we're thinking about our value option as a function of two independent variables, s and t, and I've done a second I've done a Taylor expansion, a multivariable Taylor expansion here. So when we did a one-dimensional Taylor expansion, when you did a one-dimensional Taylor expansion in calculus, you would have the first derivative, half piece with the second derivative, uh, one over three factorial, third derivative, etc. This just has the same sort of thing in multivariable. I have two first-order derivatives with respect to t and with respect to s. They're partial derivatives, so that's why I'm using those funny d's. The dt then and the ds are written to represent, um, if you took calculus, the sort of standard way is like x minus x naught or x minus a would be these brackets that end up to the power of 1 to the power of squared. Our x minus x naught, or now I, guess, I guess in this case t minus t naught and s minus s naught, where t naught and s naught are the place you're expanding this multivariable Taylor expansion about, well, those are, dt is that bracket, ds is that bracket. So I've got my first, or my two uh, first derivatives. For second derivatives, they're going to be four, because I can do v with respect to t and then t again. I can do v with respect to s and then s again. I can do v with respect to s and then with respect to t, or I could do v with respect to t and then with respect to s. But those are the same the heterogeneous um, second-order partials are the same. Why? Clairaut's theorem. So that's why there's no half in front, because I've added two of the halves together to get a whole. And the dot, dot, dot here, well, the dot, dot, dot is we've got all the cubic terms, which we're going to dump as too small in a minute anyway. So. All of these cubic terms, how can I dump them as too small? Well, they're cubics. They're going to have dt's that are of power higher than 1. So that's one of the reasons why we can just eliminate them away. So this is the approximation that I'm dealing with in the limit as dt goes to 0. Oh, I've got a ds squared. This ds squared, we're replacing it Oh, no, nope, that was just supposed to be a dt, right? Because it was root It was dx squared, so it's just a dt Now 
we've got some other DS's in here. If I replace the DS's with our what we assume the model is, now this is about to go off screen, but if I were to distribute this DT across the bracket, that would make this a DT squared and a DT DX. Oh, DT squared, too small. DX, which is like a root DT, so a DT to the half and a DT, this whole piece ends up being too small, too small, so that's gone. Now I'm only left with, oh, here's another DT squared, too small. Nice, it's getting simpler and simpler. Um, I've got this DX. And I don't think I can get rid of anything else. So now I've got what we would call a stochastic differential equation for the option value. It's stochastic because, yeah, it's got these dt deterministic pieces in it, but it's got this dx, this random variable, that's still pulled from that distribution. Now, the next thing we do is the same trick that we, the same portfolio, not really a trick, but the same portfolio that we pulled out when we were doing binomial trees. We set up a portfolio where we buy the option and we short a number of the stocks. How much? Well, delta. So we set this portfolio up. Now I'm going to differentiate this portfolio. I'm going to differentiate it with respect to the stock. No, I'm going to just plain differentiate it. Remember, sigmas are sorry, uh, delta is a number, so it's a constant. We know from seeing the earlier chapters that this delta is going to end up being our derivative of the vo of the option with respect to s. That that'll end up being what our delta will be because we've seen it before, but let's, we'll get there in a different way. So I've differentiated this portfolio. And I've got this whole piece here that I can replace this dv with. So I'm throwing all of this in for this dv. And I know what this dx or ds is. I'm using my same assumption here. So now I've got the change in portfolio is equal to I've got some DXs in here. I've got some DTs in here. I don't have any DTs that are of higher power than linear. But remember what we did with this portfolio. We wanted to hedge away risk. We wanted to make sure that the value in the portfolio stayed the same whether the stock went up or down. Well, the stock going up or down depends on um, what this DX is. So notice that let's... Let's collect on what we have. I got a DT here, I got a DT here, I got a DT here. So I'm going to make this some of the pieces some of the pieces have a DT on it. And some of the pieces don't. So that one has a DT, it's going to stay in this bracket. This VS 
with this mu s that's going to have a dt on it it stays in that bracket this does not have a dt on it so it goes outside of that bracket it does have this stuff on it though so has a dt got it has a dt got it has a dt got it oh i just need this piece here this minus delta s So how many pieces with DT? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. All the rest of this stuff, there's a DX and a DX. There's these two pieces here that have a DX stuck on the outside. All right. So now I've got... I've collected, there's one, two, three, four, five, six terms. One, two, three, four, five, six. The stuff with the DT, the deterministic part. The stuff with the DX, that's the random part. Now, all I'm going to do is, that's the random part. If I make delta equal to DVDS, then this whole bracket ends up being zero. Well, that's the bracket that has the randomness in it, the dx. So I'm, I'm picking I'm setting delta equal to dvds. So I get to choose that. Remember, we got to choose how much uh, of the stock we shorted. Oh, and remember we made note of this as V plus minus V minus over S plus minus S minus. That means that our equation simplifies too. And there's no more randomness. We've got rid of the randomness. So the change in the amount of portfolio equals whatever this is times DT. And since we know what delta is now, let's let's just pop this in here. Oh wait, then this piece and this piece totally cancel out. So this actually, man, that gets really simple. Now we're going to invoke no arbitrage. No arbitrage means that. Um, there's no risk in this anymore, so I, I should not get any. I should not get rewarded for any risk because there is no risk. We've hedged away risk. That means that this, the change in the in the change in the portfolio. So if I take pi amount of money, I could either buy this portfolio of buy a call option and short that much stock, or I could just take that money and put it into the invested at the risk free rate so it would grow proportional to the amount of time I let it grow the DT the risk free rate and how much money it actually was so this thing would just grow proportional to the amount present no arbitrage says no arbitrage says that that is equal to that. So no arbitrage says that you could either set this portfolio up and have it grow as the option and the stock, shorted stock, or you could just take that pie amount of dollars invested at the risk-free rate and your, the, the amount of money you make will be exactly the same. Well, that means I can cancel off the left side and the right side here with DT. So, cancel off the left side and the right side with DT. I don't need that bracket anymore. Oh, and 
Now I could put back in for what pi is. I know what pi is. It's this. It's v minus delta s. Oh, and I know what delta is. It's this. So actually, at this stage, that's the Black-Scholes equation. It's just not written in the sort of the traditional way. Let's make everything in the traditional way. Okay, so this is Black-Scholes equation, but it's just not in the traditional form. Let's put it into the traditional form. In the traditional form, we have everything equal to zero. So I gotta move everything over to the left-hand side. So if I distribute this R across first, And if I move this over, it's going to be positive, so it'll be a plus. And if I distribute this over, it's or move that over, that's going to be a minus, equals zero. That's almost a traditional. I'll put this S in front here, move these pieces over. There. That's... Uh, that's the Black-Scholes equation. So all we have to do is solve this Black-Scholes equation and we'll come up with um, a formula for pricing in the option. But notice to, uh, oh, and let's look what's here, what's left. Notice there's no mu in here. So the drift rate of the stock doesn't have anything to do with pricing the option. We sort of knew that back in chapter three. We got rid of it, we hedged it out, but um, it sort of demonstrates it again. It shows up only the volatility. The volatility is important. So all I need to do is find a function, V, that fits in here, whose time derivative plus a half sigma squared times S squared times its second uh, stock derivative plus R times the stock times its first stock derivative minus R times itself is equal to zero. Well, it's easier said than done, easier said than done, but notice that just pure stock solves this. So we do have a solution to this. If I say that V is equal to S, well, then there's no T in here, it's just S. So the derivative of V with respect to T would be zero. The derivative of V with respect to S would be 1. The, der the second derivative, because the first derivative is 1, then the second derivative is going to be 0. The second derivative with respect to stock. And V is equal to S. Notice that now I got 0 plus 0, RS minus RS. It does equal 0. So just straight stock is a solution to the Black-Scholes equation. Well, it does solve the partial differential equation. What it doesn't do is it doesn't satisfy the payoff of a call option or a put option. It's just stock. It's another just straight cash solves the partial differential equation if it's a constant cash. Now, I made it equal to E, the exercise price, but it works if E is just any constant cash because the derivative with respect to time, oh, time value of money we got to put in there. So it's not just straight a number, but it's that money scaled with time. So it's derivative, the derivative with respect to time would be minus R times E V R T. The derivative with respect to stock would be zero because there is no stock in it. So both these derivatives are zero. And V equals E to the R T. So I get, oh, that also solves it. So 
both pure stock solves it and both pure cash with time value of money stock solves it. Now notice that it's a linear equation, so any linear combination of time value of money and stock. So uh, V could be equal to, I don't know, some number times stock plus some number times time value of money cash. That'll also be a solution. Now, we, we've got like, well, three different solutions. Well, this one's a linear combination of the other two. But, um, and I'll leave it up to you to check that this, where A and B are constants, solves the Black-Scholes equation. But what we need now is a solution that not only solves the Black-Scholes equation, but as, t, as uh, the maturity time approaches, it becomes, the solution becomes the payoff function. Nothing that we have here is approaching the call option payoff function yet.